In this first episode, it is narrated that in ancient times, gods created humans and witches. The gods shared their powers with the witches and delivered the following message. You must replace me in guiding powerless humans. The witches obeyed the gods' command, swearing to befriend and dedicate themselves to peacefully coexisting with humans. However, in this era, humans rejected the existence of witches and even executed them. Such incidents occurred frequently everywhere, especially in the Redia Empire. Meanwhile, we are introduced to a woman and a child heading towards the empire's border in a desert region. The child is named Adonis, a student of a witch accompanying him, Chloe Morgan, the Ice Witch. Chloe is busy reading a map to find the right path while Adonis has been complaining about the heat, asking Chloe to cool him down with magic. While Chloe remains focused on the map, suddenly Adonis' smartphone reveals their current location via GPS. Chloe scolds him for using such a strange device, fearing they might be tracked. However, Adonis informs her that he made the smartphone himself, so it cannot be traced. Adonis mocks Chloe for using outdated map reading methods. After scolding Adonis out of frustration, Chloe instructs him to hurry up and walk. At that moment, Adonis still can't accept why they have to flee like this. Chloe explains once again that the human perception of witches has changed. In fact, Chloe refers to herself as a ninja because she always hides from humans. They continue their journey. Chloe plans to find a country that is more accepting of witches. If possible, she wants Adonis to attend school as well. Adonis feels it's unnecessary because he wants to remain Chloe's student. During their journey, Chloe always appears cheerful as if there were no problems. In contrast, Adonis despises this country. Suddenly, they sense something approaching. It seems there are some Imperial troops who have detected their presence. Adonis wants to confront them, but Chloe immediately stops him. She says Adonis' magic is not yet mature. Before starting to attack, Chloe first takes out her silver staff. In an instant, the approaching troops are defeated. Meanwhile, in the Imperial Palace, Goth, the 23rd Emperor, receives a report that his troops failed to capture Chloe. His subordinates explain that a witch as powerful as Chloe cannot be defeated by a small squad guarding the border. The Emperor's guards reprimand the individuals for making excuses in front of the Emperor. Back in the desert area, Adonis was frustrated because he wasn't allowed to fight. After all, he could also use magic. In this situation, he felt that learning magic was pointless. Chloe explained once again that Adonis' magic still didn't meet the standards. Adonis immediately rebutted her by demonstrating his magic directly. As Chloe's student, he felt confident in his abilities. Adonis already knew that Chloe didn't let him fight because she was also human. Chloe didn't want to let Adonis kill his own kind. However, Adonis was tired of not being able to protect Chloe. Unbeknownst to them, the soldiers Chloe had frozen earlier had brought equipment to track their location. Suddenly, Chloe and Adonis floated due to a mysterious field. Chloe didn't expect humans to resolve it so quickly. This field was a long-distance physical teleportation technique that even witches couldn't achieve. It appeared that humans were using satellites in outer space as servers. Both of them would be teleported to the central plaza of the capital. Meanwhile, in the plaza, the emperor wanted to address something. Indeed, they had been protected by magic for a long time. To avoid natural disasters and diseases, humans sought the help of witches. Humans had become grateful and revered witches. However, over time, they began to fear witches. Humans couldn't accept being subservient to the power of witches. They also wanted to live with dignity in this world. The emperor stated that all of these could be achieved with the technology developed by the empire. Various flying aircraft in the sky, city buildings made of unyielding steel against storms, automated trains for intercity travel, and the majority of the population owning smartphones. All of these were the result of the super-industrial revolution developed by this country. The emperor was confident that humans could change the world with their own power without relying on supernatural things like magic. The emperor declared that it was time to eradicate the witches. Humans would show that they were the rulers of this earth. After that, the teleportation field from earlier appeared before the emperor and the citizens. Chloe and Adonis, who were unaware of the situation, were confused. They both realized that the person in front of them was Emperor Goth. Adonis immediately tried to divert attention so that Chloe could escape. However, he was immediately restrained by the emperor's guards. Chloe became furious when she saw Adonis being treated this way. She threatened to freeze all the people here if the emperor didn't release Adonis. Emperor Goth just smiled and didn't respond. Chloe had prepared her powerful magic, Absolute Zero. In reality, Chloe didn't want to fight against humans. If they were annihilated, Adonis would lose his way back. 
Just as Chloe was about to unleash her magic, for some reason, her magic disappeared. It turned out that the Emperor had prepared a photon magic inhibitor device located underground. Adonis, who was being restrained, was also puzzled because his magic couldn't activate. Emperor Goth forcibly tore Chloe's clothes while she was helpless. He then slapped her as if Chloe were just an ordinary woman. The citizens also laughed at Chloe, who was in this state. Adonis, of course, became very angry even though he couldn't do anything right now. Emperor Goth couldn't stand Adonis' noise. He ordered his guards to kill Adonis. Chloe immediately prostrated herself before Emperor Goth. She was willing to offer herself in exchange for Adonis' safety. Chloe also lied, claiming that Adonis was just a human she had abducted and raised as a slave. She begged the Emperor to forgive her fellow human. Emperor Goth approached and pointed a pistol at Chloe's head. Chloe was prepared for her fate. Before that, she wanted to thank Adonis for everything. However, it was Adonis who felt he should be thankful. When he was a child, Adonis, an orphan, was found and cared for by Clo. Before he could finish his sentence, Emperor Goth shot Clo in the head. This shot was followed by more shots by the Emperor's guards. Finally, Clo's head was severed and shown to the watching crowd. In the past, the gods had said that one day humans would fear witches. However, the gods still advised witches to befriend humans and bring peace to them. If they became hostile, chaos and darkness would befall the world. Now, 10 years had passed since that event. The Redia Empire held a female prisoner from another country they had attacked. Two people were seen arguing over a piece of bread. Then, a pink-haired girl offered her bread to them. The girl's name was Daroka. Her friend, Anna, naturally worried about Daroka. After that, Anna contemplated their current fate. No matter how advanced technology was due to the super-industrial revolution, humans still fought each other. In the end, the war never ceased. People used to say that humans would live happily if witches were eradicated. But the reality wasn't as beautiful as that. Daroka tried to comfort Anna with her toy dolls. She pretended to play as a knight and a princess. Just when Anna's mood had brightened, the guards suddenly called for prisoner number 218. The prisoners were very frightened because those who were called never returned. This was the fourth time the summons had been made. Immediately, Anna's face turned pale when she realized that she was number 218. Doroka also became aware of this. Without Anna's knowledge, Doroka had swapped their numbers. She then confessed to being prisoner number 218. The guards brought Doroka to the head warden named Palpol. Palpol ordered the guards to remove Doroka's clothes. Palpol informed her that Doroka would be used to serve important people of the Redia Empire. Doroka was shocked to learn this fact. Palpol felt arrogant because he was from the Redia Empire. Redia was indeed a country that drove the super-industrial revolution, leading to rapid human civilization development. They were the ones who defeated the witches with technology and military power, reclaiming human dignity. Because of this, Palpol looked down on Doroka, who was just a prisoner from another country. Suddenly, Palpol tried to force a selfie with Doroka. In that moment, Doroka seized the opportunity and bit Palpol's finger. With that, Doroka managed to escape and also took Palpol's smartphone. While running, Doroka tried to free other prisoners through the smartphone she had taken. Unfortunately, the smartphone had voice-based authentication. After several attempts, Doroka tried to mimic Palpol's voice. Strangely enough, Doroka succeeded in passing the authentication in this manner. The prison became even more chaotic as all the prisoners tried to escape. Doroka ran as fast as she could until she reached a large door. She also opened the large door using Palpol's smartphone. Unfortunately, the door turned out not to be an exit. Daroka, who no longer knew where to go, was finally chased by the guards. However, the guards were currently in a panic because all the facilities in the prison were open, including the one they had entered through the large door earlier. In the middle of the room, there was a large iron cage that seemed to have high security classification. When the cage opened, a man was revealed, his entire body wrapped in bandages and bound with chains. The man immediately removed all his restraints. For some reason, he also appeared filled with great anger. Moving on to episode 2, the man who was previously confined in a high security capsule is now free as well. The guards refer to him as prisoner 1001, and they are in a state of panic because this is a high classification case. Three guards then decide to confront prisoner 1001 to prevent the wrath of Warden Palpol. Strangely, it appears that Daroka recognizes the prisoner. Following this, prisoner 1001 dispatches the three guards who attempted to kill him. Armed with a pistol taken from the guards, 
Prisoner 1001 approaches the defenseless Doroka and points the pistol at her. Doroka lies there believing she has been shot. However, it turns out that Prisoner 1001 aimed his shot to release the shackles binding Doroka. Shortly thereafter, the detention camp announces to all the guards that the doors of the first to six prison zones have been opened. Many prisoners have escaped as a result. Meanwhile, in the State Security Bureau building, the head of state security is giving orders to someone. The head of the bureau asks the person to go to the Mayhem detention camp and report on the situation there. The person agrees with a relaxed attitude, as if playing around. The head of the bureau is senior officer Yamato, accompanied by his younger sister, Officer Yuki, who is the deputy head of the bureau. It appears that Yuki does not appreciate the attitude of the officer sent by her brother. Despite her attitude, Yamato warns Yuki not to antagonize him. The officer is named Ikout, and he is a backbone of the country, just like Yuki. At this moment, Palpal is in the storage room of confiscated items in the Mayhem detention camp. He is in a state of panic because this room has also been opened. His subordinates explain that all of this happened because the escaped girl prisoner managed to pass voice authentication on Palpal's smartphone. However, he finds this situation impossible. Even if the voice authentication succeeded, Palpal does not have the authority to open prisoner 1001 cell. That prisoner is a level SS danger, serving a permanent sentence, a student of magic, Adonis, and the magic pen that was in the storage room is now missing. Adonis, who has escaped, is now on top of a building, trying out his magic. It turns out that his written summoning magic is activated when he writes with his pen. While activating the magic, Adonis fires a bullet from his pistol. Adonis makes the shot bullet expand greatly using his magic. Consequently, the colossal bullet hits a building in front of him. After confirming that his magic works, Adonis intends to eliminate all the people here. On the other hand, Ekout has arrived at the Mayhem detention camp and reported that Adonis is not there. He then received another report of a building being hit by a colossal bullet, most likely the work of Adonis. Before Ekout departs, he intends to eliminate the root cause of the problem, Warden Palpol. At the same time, it appears that Daroka has also managed to escape from the detention camp. She is shocked when she sees the massive bullet hitting a building and blames herself for releasing a dangerous prisoner. Meanwhile, Adonis is currently muttering to himself. He is certain that Chloe would not approve of his intention to kill all humans. Ten years have passed since then, and Adonis has never forgotten everything that happened to Chloe. He then uses his magic in the middle of the street, summoning a giant stone warrior that emerges from the ground. The giant warrior proceeds to destroy everything in its path while carrying Adonis in its left palm. Not far from there, a police station receives a call about a giant appearing in the area. The police officers who take the call are naturally skeptical. Suddenly, a car crashes into the police station. The driver of the car appears extremely frightened, having seen something unsettling. The police officer who checks on the driver accuses them of driving under the influence of drugs. The officer then calls the central office to request the narcotics division to come over. As the officer steps out a bit, they realize that there is indeed a giant in the area. It seems like they need security bureau members to come here. Adonis' current main objective is to go to the palace and eliminate Emperor Goth. In the security bureau building, Yamato receives a detailed report about the appearance of the giant. Yamato asks if anyone has reported this to Emperor Goth. It appears that this information has not reached Emperor Goth due to the authority bureau's interference. Based on the Empress's statement, Emperor Goth's condition has not improved. After hearing this, Yamato decides to declare a state of emergency using his authority. Yamato has prepared various forces to deal with the giant. He observes the current situation from a distance and is puzzled by how the stone giant can move. Yuki, who is with him, receives a report that Prisoner 1001 and the magic pen from the Mayhem detention camp have disappeared. This suggests that the giant is likely a result of the magic used by Adonis, the student of magic. Upon hearing this, Yamato feels that this situation can be more easily handled. They just need to use the photon magic inhibitor devices in the underground chamber. Unfortunately, these devices are from 10 years ago, and they are not sure if they still function. Yamato entrusts the device issue to Yuki. It appears that a tank battalion is aiming at the giant. On the first shot, all their cannons miss the target. 
when they fired for the second time, for some reason, their cannons also didn't hit the giant. It turns out that Adonis was using magic to deflect the cannons. Adonis then controls the giant to destroy a building, directing the debris towards the tank battalion. During the 10 years of his confinement, Adonis used that time for limitless thinking simulations. There's only one way for non-magic users to employ magic, and that's through written summoning magic. They must understand the structure of magic, systematize it, and then turn it into a formula with a special feather pen. Without the guidance of a great mentor, this method can't be comprehended. From the giant's palm, Adonis uses his magic to create two machine guns and shoots at all the people in front of him. At the same time, Ekout observes the giant from a distance and reports it to the head of the security bureau. As suspected by the security bureau, the mastermind behind the giant is Adonis, the student of magic. Shortly after that, fighter jets approach the giant. The missiles they launch successfully hit the giant, but the explosion also affects the people in the vicinity. Adonis is now lying down due to the impact of the missile explosion. It seems that his body has indeed become slower compared to 10 years ago. Meanwhile, we are shown Emperor Guth, who is seriously ill and sleeping in his bed. Emperor Goth hears the commotion outside, but the Empress reassures him and tells him to rest. In reality, Emperor Goth did not expect to be afflicted with an incurable disease. Whether it's a curse or not, he doesn't know. Nevertheless, Emperor Goth does not regret his actions. This nation has built an advanced scientific civilization and has eradicated all the witches to allow humanity to progress. According to Emperor Goth, if there were still witches in the world, humanity would never advance. Humanity must use its own strength to pave the way. That's why Emperor Goth believes he has done the right thing. On the other hand, all the troops that stormed Adonis have lost contact with the command center. It appears that they have been completely slaughtered. Shortly after that, the security bureau received a report that a civilian was approaching Adonis. Adonis is currently strangling the last surviving soldier before killing him. Before he does it, suddenly, Daroka's voice is heard asking Adonis to stop. Daroka can't bear to see so many innocent lives being taken. She doesn't want any more innocent people to die. Upon hearing this, Adonis immediately kills the soldier he was strangling. He laughs when Daroka refers to the people he killed as innocent. Adonis starts thinking about something even more horrifying, regardless of whether they are from Redia or not. All humans are his enemies, including Doroka, who is a prisoner. Suddenly, Doroka mentions that Klo would never want Adonis to do this. Adonis becomes even angrier because Doroka is talking about Klo so casually. He now considers Doroka as bait to hinder him before the next wave of troops arrives. Adonis is well aware of the cunning tricks humans use. Just like 10 years ago, Adonis and Klo would never lose if they fought fairly and honestly. Unexpectedly, Daroka admits that she is a witch. Nevertheless, Adonis doesn't believe that there are witches left in this world. He becomes even angrier, thinking that Daroka is pretending to be a witch. However, Daroka insists that she is one of the survivors of the witch hunts. Although it is true, Adonis remains angry because they did not come to save Klo at that time. Daroka apologizes, explaining that at that time the witches were busy escaping. Adonis does not accept her apology, it's too late, Klo cannot come back to life. Surprisingly, Daroka states that Klo can be resurrected. At first, Adonis does not believe it and considers it an insult. However, Daroka explains that she came to this country to save Adonis, all for the purpose of resurrecting Klo. To do that, Adonis is a necessary requirement. There must be memories belonging to both Adonis and Klo. Adonis still doesn't care, he wants to kill everyone who disrespected Klo and everyone who mentioned her name. It seems that Daroka failed to convince him. She accepts if Adonis wants to kill her. As he looks at Daroka's face, Adonis is reminded of Klo, who smiled in her final moments. His intention wavers and Adonis starts to shed tears. In reality, he wants to believe that Klo can be resurrected. At that moment, Daroka reaches out her hand to Adonis. Before he can grasp it, Daroka's body is suddenly split in half by a sniper shot. Continuing with episode 3, we are shown Daroka's past when her village was set on fire by the humans. Amidst the chaos, Mia, an older acquaintance of Daroka, came to comfort her. Mia herself had no idea why humans suddenly attacked the village. Their relationship had been harmonious until then. 
Not long before this incident, they had even gone to the city together to cure Lord Tom's illness. Doroka then thought of using magic to fight back, but Mia said it would be futile. The humans had a device that could seal magic. Mia was convinced that Lady Ophelia knew something. Therefore, she instructed Doroka to run away immediately and inform Lady Ophelia about everything. To boost her spirits, Mia picked up a night doll lying on the ground and pretended to use it. Finally, with a heavy heart, Doroka took the doll and headed towards Lady Ophelia's location. Fortunately, Mia let Doroka leave just in time before the humans arrived to capture Mia again. In the present time, Doroka appeared to be on the brink of death after being shot by a sniper. Adonis hoped that Doroka could still survive because she was the one who knew how to resurrect Klo. In that moment, Doroka revealed something that left Adonis confused about what to do. Suddenly, more troops arrived. Reluctantly, Adonis had to evade and let Doroka get shot. Adonis then used his magic again. The troops kept firing in panic, but all their shots were stopped and none hit Adonis. Even the halted bullets were redirected and fired back at the troops. A sniper on top of a building waited for an opportunity to shoot again. When Adonis was in their sights, the sniper took a shot. However, Adonis seemed completely unharmed. The sniper's bullet was successfully stopped, reversed, and multiplied several times. The sniper could only resign to their unfortunate fate. Adonis felt that the humans were foolish to believe they could win against magic. Adonis wouldn't allow the humans to live peacefully after killing Klo. From the central office, the head of the security bureau could only watch his troops being massacred. However, he still held hope for Yuki, who was assigned to activate the magic photon inhibitor device. Meanwhile, Yuki finally reached the underground chamber where the device was located. There, she encountered a person in charge who had anticipated that the security bureau would come here. He was the head of the science bureau, Theta Samantha. Theta strongly advised Yuki against activating the device. Naturally, Yuki sought an explanation for his statement. Afterward, Yamato received a phone call from Yuki. When he answered, he realized that the voice on the other end was Thetis. Theta wanted to discuss something with Yamato. However, the security bureau was running out of time. Adonis continued to eliminate all the troops sent their way. As Theta had told Yuki, the magic photon inhibitor device must not be activated. Indeed, science has been a beacon for humanity. Nevertheless, there are still many things in science that they cannot yet unravel. One of these mysteries is the mysterious particles emitted by the magic photon inhibitor device. Theta inquired if Yamato knew about the syndrome of cell function loss. Yamato was aware that many soldiers experienced this condition during the witch hunts 10 years ago. There were likely several factors, but the exact cause remained uncertain. However, the Science Bureau believed that the mysterious particles were the root cause. The magic photon inhibitor device would destroy the body's cells. Yamato, as the new head of the Security Bureau, was only now learning about this information. Understandably, the news about this had been kept concealed. Ironically, in this world, there were no longer any witches who could mend nature. The atmosphere capable of purifying these hazardous particles had disappeared. It could be said that humanity had lost the gift of nature. If people were exposed to these particles, their bodies would disintegrate. We had been fighting for humanity and standing continuously in front of the magic photon inhibitor device. Yamato should be aware of Emperor Goat's current state. In other words, his illness was caused by these mysterious particles. In the midst of Yamato's conversation with Theta, Adonis continued to eliminate all incoming troops. Yamato felt confused about what to do. On the other hand, Yuki, despite being warned about the danger of the device, remained undeterred and attempted to activate it. She cared little about the illness or anything else. All she knew was that there was a magical threat right before her eyes. Furthermore, her sibling had entrusted this task to her. Observing the situation, Theta instructed everyone in the room to evacuate. Meanwhile, Theta herself tried to stop Yuki. Yuki still paid no heed to Theta's warnings and eventually activated the device. Subsequently, Adonis, who had been using magic all along, suddenly found that his magic was no longer functioning. Yamato, observing the situation from the central office, was bewildered by what was happening. Theta had already stated that the magic photon inhibitor device should not have been activated. Yamato immediately contacted Theta. On the other hand, Theta had successfully deactivated the device. However, Yuki had lost consciousness and both of them seemed to be affected by the mentioned illness. 
Nevertheless, Theta assured Yamato not to worry about them and instructed him to focus on Adonis. Seeing an opportunity, the security bureau promptly launched an ambush. A female soldier stepped forward alone to eliminate Adonis. She held deep resentment towards Adonis for daring to destroy the country. At that very moment, the rooftop of a building beside them collapsed between them and other soldiers. Unfazed, the female soldier remained determined to finish off Adonis. In that moment, Adonis appeared to have accepted his fate. This way, he could join Chloe as well. Eventually, the soldier beheaded Adonis with a thermochemical bayonet on her rifle. Meanwhile, other soldiers were naturally concerned for the safety of the female soldier due to the collapsing building. They also couldn't see well due to the dust. Shortly thereafter, they saw a silhouette approaching them. The female soldier returned to her unit carrying the head of Adonis, the witch's disciple. They cheered for their victory. The unit at the central office also rejoiced over this triumph. Yamato, too, felt relieved when he saw this. However, he still had the duty of assisting the affected citizens of this battle. Additionally, Adonis' body would be taken for further examination. Then, Yamato instructed his subordinates to check on the conditions of Theta and Yuki. Several people entered the room with the magic photon inhibitor device to assist Theta and Yuki, who had fainted and were lying on the floor. After this victory, the ailing Emperor Goth delivered a speech in the square as usual. He informed everyone that the youth captured ten years ago had managed to escape and was the one responsible for this dreadful tragedy. He also revealed the fact that Adonis, the witch's disciple, was, in fact, a human, just like them. However, he had been deceived by magic. After ten years of effort, they still didn't understand how Adonis could control magic as a human. Nonetheless, this disaster had occurred because Emperor Goth had allowed Adonis to live. Still, Emperor Goth believed that their nation was at the pinnacle of the world. They had harnessed the power of science and possessed an indomitable army. They would not be defeated by any evil. Emperor Goth's condolences speech had spread widely on video platforms that could be viewed through smartphones. In a school, they mourned the loss of the students there. In that school, a student asked her teacher why the witch's disciple would side with witches if he was also a human. The teacher naturally didn't know how to respond and simply said that the student might have been brainwashed. The bell for break time rang. Then, a bespectacled girl approached a brown-haired girl. It was unclear what she meant, but the bespectacled girl mentioned that she had seen what the brown-haired girl had done. After school, the brown-haired girl went to the memorial site filled with bottles and photos of the victims. It turned out that the girl, Eri, had left her boyfriend, Takuma, who had been crushed by concrete during the chaos. Takuma died because of Eri. She felt guilty, but for some reason, Eri had a lot of photos of Adonis, the witch's disciple, on her phone. Her boyfriend had just died, yet she seemed infatuated with Adonis. Suddenly, a bespectacled man appeared behind Eri. Judging by his attire, it appeared he was a government official. Eri became panicked and quickly began deleting the photos on her smartphone. However, the man told her not to bother. He only warned Eri not to show them to anyone else and assured her that he would report it. Still feeling panicked, Eri left the area. Right after Eri left, the man made a phone call to someone. He reported the presence of a high school girl infatuated with a terrorist. He requested that the person he called apprehend the girl. Suddenly, a soldier approached the man. Apparently, the man was named Oz, and he was the head of the intelligence bureau. They were patrolling various disaster sites. The person he had called earlier was a girl named Charmy. Charmy was a technology expert who often teased Oz. In truth, Charmy had long submitted a transfer request, but Oz had never approved it. If this continued, Charmy would be forced to report Oz to the labor bureau. Why not? Charmy liked to assign overtime work and belittle her subordinates. It seemed that only the unit led by Oz had such a toxic environment. By the way, Charmy had something to report. She had just released the results of an analysis that was bad news. Charmy would provide the details when Oz returned to the office, but the bottom line was that the witch's disciple's body turned out to be fake. Continuing with episode 4, Adonis was seen wearing a patient's gown, writhing in pain. He was surrounded by four nurses. However, their location didn't resemble a hospital. It was a bright place filled with flowers. At this moment, Adonis's body temperature, heart rate, and blood pressure were steadily rising. If this continued, his heart wouldn't endure. One of the nurses mentioned that humans were still unable to perform multidimensional teleportation. From her words, it could be assumed that they were witches. At that time, an elderly witch arrived. 
She stimulated Adonis' brain to return to normal. Nevertheless, Adonis continued to cry out in pain, mentioning Chloe's name. As it turned out, when Adonis was about to be executed by a female warrior, the warrior revealed her true identity as a witch. She used magic for duplication and faking her own death. This witch's name was Anna, and she was a witch who had infiltrated this realm along with Daroka. From the beginning, their plan was to revive Clo. That's why Anna would help Adonis escape from there. Suddenly, Anna looked up at the sky and asked Mrs. Ophelia to take Adonis away. Then, a white spherical object carried Adonis away from there. Back in the present, Adonis, whose pain had subsided, wondered who the people in front of him were. After closer inspection, Adonis finally realized that this place was the Witch Kingdom. Following this, Adonis was wheeled in a wheelchair because he had not fully recovered. During the journey, he met two witches who seemed to be familiar with Clo. They both claimed to have been taken care of by Clo since they were children. After a brief conversation, Adonis continued his journey. He finally arrived to meet Mrs. Ophelia. At that moment, Adonis requested to be let off the wheelchair, feeling capable of walking on his own. However, Mrs. Ophelia advised against it. This place was a secret territory that humans couldn't enter. Bringing Adonis here was already very difficult and could have adverse effects on his body. Adonis also remembered being carried by the white spherical object. Mrs. Ophelia explained that she had invited Adonis to become Clo's apprentice. It wasn't just Mrs. Ophelia and a few others who knew Clo. Every witch in this kingdom knew her. She was stronger than anyone, very wise and cheerful. Despite being an ice-attributed witch, her heart was as warm as the sun. However, she was actually expelled from the witch kingdom. Adonis corrected by saying that Clo wasn't expelled, but rather banished for teaching magic to a human. Clova never directly talked about it, but Adonis could feel it after living with her for a while. Mrs. Ophelia stated that magic was something irreplaceable for witches. Magic was proof of love and sacrifice bestowed by the god to guide humanity. That's why teaching magic to humans was considered taboo. Clo accepted humans as her students. No one knew why she did it. At that moment, all the witches pleaded with Clo to leave her student and return to the witch kingdom. But she responded with just one word, sorry. After recounting everything, Mrs. Ophelia was about to return Adonis's feather pen. Adonis, who was initially sitting in a wheelchair, forced himself to walk and retrieve it. Mrs. Ophelia mentioned that the pen was made of phoenix feathers and adorned with sea waves and red dragon eyes. It was Clo who had made the pen for Adonis. In that moment, Adonis recalled the words of Doroka and Anna. He then asked Mrs. Ophelia if Clo could truly be resurrected. Mrs. Ophelia stated that witches would not lie. Adonis felt relieved upon hearing this. He then looked up and found a strange sight before him. Mrs. Ophelia explained that the round object he was seeing was the Earth, his place of origin. They were now on the moon, where the witch king was located. This place was untouchable by humans. The witches came here ten years ago and established this sacred place for themselves. It was a new witch kingdom called Luna Milia. Adonis was led out of the kingdom area by Mrs. Ophelia. He had to wear an astronaut suit, while Mrs. Ophelia needed nothing. At that moment, Mrs. Ophelia talked about how science had revealed the true nature of humans. Perhaps God had created this spherical universe to prevent humans from seeing something beyond their capabilities because God was concerned about the future of humanity. Despite this, Adonis no longer believed in God after all he had been through. Outside the kingdom area, there were tombstones for deceased witches. Mrs. Ophelia continued her story. She said that humans were often blinded by misconceptions. They considered the night before dawn to be the darkest night. The opposite of love was indifference. In reality, the sky gradually brightened with the arrival of dawn. Then the opposite of love was hostility. Humans had also wrongly believed that witches contaminated humanity. What was even worse was that this belief was shared by the human king. Afterward, they re-entered the kingdom area. Mrs. Ophelia showed Adonis the Tree of Life. The tree was the one that gave birth to witches. Adonis was seeing it directly for the first time. Clo didn't want to tell him much about the birth of witches. As already known, all witches were of the same gender. Unlike humans, they couldn't have offspring. So they received their lives from this tree and were born from fruit with divine power. The Tree of Life before them now was the last one brought from Earth. All the other trees of life had been burned by humans. After digesting Mrs. Ophelia's words, Adonis suspected that perhaps Clo could be resurrected through this tree of life. 
Mrs. Ophelia explained that the fruit attached to the tree of life at the moment was just an ordinary witch waiting to be born. However, to be born as Clo, the fruit needed Adonis' power. Adonis still didn't fully understand. Mrs. Ophelia then explained that magic itself was the result of materializing thoughts. If Adonis could master written summoning magic, he could materialize anything with his thoughts. One example was memories. Memories were the source of life. If Adonis could transfer all his memories of Clo to the fruit on the tree of life, there was a possibility that Clo could be resurrected. After explaining everything, Mrs. Ophelia gave Adonis time to prepare for the ritual. Adonis lay near the tree of life. He still couldn't believe he could bring Clo back. Suddenly, a witch approached him. It seemed she was a witch disguised as a warrior Anna. Anna was still angry because Daroka died because of Adonis. However, Adonis seemed not to care. After all, it was the witch's plan to save him. Adonis felt it was unfair for him to be blamed. Anna then wondered why they would sacrifice their lives to save someone like Adonis. Adonis, upon hearing this, was cynical. The witches were doing it to exploit Clo. Before Daroka died, she had informed Adonis about the witches who wanted to exploit Clo. In addition, the witches who could survive in an atmosphere without wearing astronaut suits were busy creating a facility like this. That meant this place would be used as a cage for humans. Adonis suspected that the witches would likely abduct human slaves or children through multidimensional teleportation. After that, they would be taught written summoning magic and allowed to fight against humans themselves. The only way for the nearly extinct witches to defeat humans was by using substitute combat power. However, only Clo could create the feather pen. That's why the witches wanted to resurrect her. Anna panicked because Adonis now knew everything. She pleaded with Adonis to help them, not wanting Daroka's sacrifice to be in vain. However, Adonis stated that his only desire was to resurrect Clo. Then, if Clo refused to help the witches, Adonis would also consider the witches as enemies. After that, Mrs. Ophelia, Adonis, and some other witches were preparing to start the ritual. Then, Adonis used written summoning magic to summon his memories of Clo. Those memories were then placed into the fruit on the Tree of Life. While doing so, Adonis remembered when he and Clo talked about constellations. Thanks to Clo's teachings, Adonis had memorized many constellations. There was a constellation named Adonis, named by Clo. However, it seemed that Clo had somewhat forgotten that she had named a constellation after him. From that memory alone, Adonis felt that nothing could replace the time they had spent together. Thinking about it, Adonis felt like he was dreaming. Adonis also recalled another memory. Clo, who was casually undressing while taking a bath, left her clothes on the floor. When passing by the bath area, her curtain accidentally opened a bit, allowing Adonis to see Clo. Clo's body was covered in bruises. Clo, realizing this, warned Adonis not to peek. Adonis, with mixed feelings of embarrassment and pity, tried to change the subject. He also reminded Clo not to bathe for too long, as pursuers could appear at any time. At that moment, Clo suddenly cried. She felt grateful because Adonis was always there for her. If it weren't for Adonis, Clo believed she wouldn't be able to survive in this world. And now, Adonis felt the same way about Clo. Slowly, all his memories of Clo entered the fruit on the Tree of Life. Until, eventually, the fruit gave birth to a witch. However, the witch who was born did not look like Clo. For some reason, this witch looked more like Daroka with pink hair. Continuing to episode 5, in the middle of the ritual, Adonis decided not to resurrect Clo. He loved her too much, so he didn't want Clo to go through the same torment again. There's no place for the woman he loves in this rotten world. So Adonis made an exchange in his memory summoning. That's why the newly reborn pink-haired witch turned out to be Doroka herself. Doroka woke up, confused by the situation. In front of her was Adonis, but she realized that this place was Lunamilia, the witch kingdom. She was also confused about why she could be here. Doroka seemed to remember that she had been shot dead before. Adonis said that he just wanted to repay Doroka for saving him in Rivia. Doroka just realized that she was naked and in Adonis' embrace. She immediately moved away because she felt very embarrassed. At that moment, Mrs. Ophelia started to speak. She stated that Adonis didn't know how to be grateful. After all, the witches here had helped him with everything he needed. They were even willing to risk their lives to save Adonis so he could resurrect Clo. However, Adonis wasted it. Other witches whispered that perhaps Adonis had forgotten Clo because he was interested in Daroka. Mrs. Ophelia confirmed this with Daroka. She wanted to know if Daroka had said anything to Adonis. 
In reality, Daroka did reveal something to Adonis, but she couldn't tell Mrs. Ophelia about it. Adonis then replied that he was the one who decided not to resurrect Clo. They all didn't need to interfere. When Mrs. Ophelia was about to attack Adonis, suddenly there was a teleportation particle, a human technology. Adonis had decided that he didn't need the witch's help. He would deal with the humans on his own. It turned out that Adonis had brought a tracking chip with him intentionally so that the humans could come here. After that, Adonis activated the chip near the Tree of Life. Shortly after that, the human forces led by Yamato arrived. A water-attributed witch tried to extinguish the fire on the Tree of Life, but she was immediately killed by a warrior nearby. Then Mrs. Ophelia ordered Santa Maria to activate her magic that could provide magical shields to the others. The battle between humans and witches became inevitable. Meanwhile, Adonis would confront Yamato directly. When Yamato tried to close the gap with his sword, Adonis used his magic to snatch the pistol Yamato was carrying. Yamato was thrown back when Adonis shot him. However, it seemed that his armor was strong enough that he didn't receive serious injuries. Nevertheless, Adonis kept shooting at Yamato. At that moment, Daroka approached Adonis as if she wanted to stop him. On the other side, the battle between witches and humans continued. There was a crystal-attributed witch who used her crystals to cover the humans' bodies. The crystals continued to grow even when destroyed, until they couldn't breathe because of the crystals covering their bodies. There were also witches with snake, scorpion, and root attributes who could turn the situation around. Mrs. Ophelia herself was a witch who could use physical magic. She flew the humans into the air. They tried to shoot Mrs. Ophelia, the bullets were redirected and missed her completely. She continued to lift the humans into the air, then crushed all their bodies in an instant. When Mrs. Ophelia thought that the witches had won, the humans teleported a second army there. At that moment, the witches were outnumbered. Meanwhile, some high-ranking officials from Redia were watching the events on the moon. One of them was the head of the Theta Science Bureau, whose life was not going to last long due to the Foden Magic Inhibitor device. The head of the Dynasma Government Bureau asked Theta for an explanation of why many witches were still alive. Theta explained that this country had the DASH-89 satellite. Initially, it was used for physical teleportation prototypes. However, with the addition of new satellites, Dash 89 was left in space during the witch extermination operation. But after they checked the camera on Dash 89, it seemed that the satellite had been taken over by the witches. Dynasma did not expect the witches to use human technology to escape far into space. The Science Bureau itself had just learned about this, and the buildings that the witches had erected on the moon were not detected by the sky mirror radar because they concealed them with magic. Dynasma felt that the Science Bureau was entirely useless. They were one of the country's four elite bureaus. Besides, the Science Bureau always received a large budget every year. Dynasma was certainly annoyed if they didn't contribute at all. The government had already announced to the people that the extermination of witches had been completed 10 years ago. This problem would not be resolved by executing Theta, the head of the Science Bureau. Suddenly, the head of the Intelligence Bureau, Shirusaki, began to get bored with Dynasma's rant. Since the beginning, Shirusagi had been lying down and sitting rudely in this meeting. Before Yamato teleported to the moon, he visited his younger sister who was being treated in a tank. Theta offered to help save Yuki. Theta stated that Yuki would be safe in the hands of the Science Bureau. Yuki had always been with him. When Yamato joined the Security Bureau, Yuki joined as well. When Yamato became the Bureau Head, Yuki became the Deputy Bureau Head. In fact, she was the youngest Deputy Head in history although she was not naturally suited for a government position. That's why Yamato held a grudge against Adonis for causing all of this. Returning to his current battle with Adonis, Yamato forced the output of his wrist armor to 500%. Meanwhile, Adonis continued to use his tactics, shooting with his pistol. However, Yamato moved very quickly and managed to punch Adonis. Duroka, who was worried, approached Adonis. She should have been more cautious because Yamato could potentially kill her. At that moment, Yamato seemed to be preparing his finishing move. He had been daydreaming about living peacefully somewhere with his younger sister. After that, Yamato drew his sword from its sheath, which was brimming with energy. It was a finishing move he called the Demon Banishing Aido attack. The attack's range extended far ahead, cutting everything in its path in half. Even Doroka would have been hit by the attack if she had not been saved by Anna using her magic of duplication and feigning death. Unfortunately, it turned out that Anna had risked her life to save Doroka. 
Anna was split in two right in front of Daroka. The headquarters in Redia attempted to contact the soldiers on the moon, but they received no response. The headquarters had lost visual contact there, so they couldn't confirm anything. Yamato's recent attack seemed to spare no one. It appeared that some of his fellow soldiers were also affected by the attack. While Daroka cried hysterically over the events, Adonis and Yamato continued their battle. Adonis coated his arms with a layer of steel. His magically reinforced arms could break Yamato's sword. Adonis also managed to injure Yamato's chest with his punches. At one point, Yamato was finally able to block Adonis' attack and restore his shattered sword. Adonis couldn't believe how rapidly science had progressed. It almost felt like cheating. Yamato retorted that magic was also a form of cheating. On the other hand, it seemed that a few witches were still alive. They had resigned themselves to the current situation. The last tree of life in the world had burned down. There would be no more witches born. Everything had been wiped out. Although one witch continued to voice her refusal to give up, it did not motivate the other witches. They had been struck by the harsh reality of this massacre. The witch who had not surrendered suggested that they help Adonis eliminate the humans. However, suddenly, another group of soldiers arrived. They were there to slaughter any remaining witches. Meanwhile, Yamato, feeling cornered, adjusted the thermal output setting his armor to the maximum level. As a result, Yamato generated a temporary tornado around his body. Adonis, who did not expect this, was thrown back by the tornado. Seizing the opportunity, Yamato leaped forward to stab Adonis. He succeeded in doing so, making Adonis slightly overwhelmed. However, it turned out that Adonis had prepared a spell since a while ago. Without Yamato's awareness, a giant sword suddenly appeared, cutting off his entire left arm. He immediately requested his armor to perform hemostatic procedures to restore his left arm. Somehow, Adonis smiled when he saw Yamato. He felt that they were similar because they both shared a desire for revenge. They even had the same facial expressions. Although Adonis had cut off Yamato's left arm, it seemed that Yamato still had the upper hand. Adonis himself couldn't heal or alleviate the pain he was feeling. When Adonis couldn't move much, Yamato approached him and swung his sword. He wouldn't let the dangerous Adonis stay alive. Yamato would make him die along with the other witches. At the end of the episode, the headquarters was still in panic because they had no visual or communication from the soldiers who teleported to the moon. Some of them were even pessimistic that all the troops had been annihilated. Others didn't believe it because elite security bureau forces were sent there. Even head of the security bureau, Yamato, was among them. Then they happened to detect a signal from a personal terminal. It turned out the signal came from head of the security bureau Yamato himself. He reported that all the witches on the moon had been successfully eliminated. Continuing to episode 6, just before Yamato beheaded Adonis, Daroka, who had grown weary, shouted for them to stop all of this. Strangely, Yamato and the other human warriors completely halted. Yamato couldn't move his own body. It appeared that Daroka wasn't just shouting, she was using her magic, the magic of love, restraint. Doroka then approached Yamato, the leader of this troop. The other warriors were powerless to stop Doroka. Yamato felt incredibly strange because he was following Doroka's commands. He never expected there was such dangerous magic. Other surviving witches saw an opportunity for life if Doroka used her magic. However, many of them felt it was too late for Doroka to do so. Meanwhile, Yamato struggled with all his might to free himself from the influence of the love magic, but it seemed very difficult to do so. On the other side, Adonis became ecstatic and told Daroka to quickly finish off Yamato. Then, Daroka reached out her hand to the still resisting Yamato. She asked to end the war and make peace. She also instructed Yamato to truly say that they would not fight again. She then made a request not to hunt witches and Adonis anymore. If Yamato complied, Daroka would release her magic. However, it seemed that Adonis did not accept the peaceful path Daroka requested. He reminded Daroka that Anna had been killed by these humans. After seeing so many of their kind killed, he shouldn't let humans live and return to Earth. The surviving witches agreed with his words. Adonis also declared that if Daroka didn't kill Yamato now, she would be the one to die. Suddenly, Yamato regained the ability to move freely and repeatedly struck Daroka. He also felt vengeance and did not want peace with the witches. Yamato stated that witches were bringers of misfortune who caused unrest and chaos. So many innocent people died tragically because of magic. 
If there was no magic, Yuki's body wouldn't have turned out like that. Doroka, who had been resigned to being beaten, suddenly said that humans were just the same. They had killed many innocent people. Examples include the witch hunts 10 years ago and the events of today. Doroka wondered, even though humans had scientific power and could stand on their own, humans and witches shouldn't kill each other. Doroka still hoped that Yamato would end this war. It seemed that at that moment, Doroka used her magic again. Yamato found it difficult to hit her again. He truly didn't understand the feelings of love within himself. Despite trying his best to resist, in the end, Yamato succumbed. He said he would obey all of Doroka's words. However, at the same time, Adonis approached and immediately split Yamato's head. For Adonis, there was no word for peace. He only wanted revenge. Nevertheless, he acknowledged that Doroka's magic was indeed very strong. Adonis asked Doroka to help him eradicate humanity with that magic. Meanwhile on Earth, a member of the Security Bureau is reporting the events on the moon to Emperor Goth. The member reports that Bureau Chief Yamato and his troops are currently fighting witches, but they don't know the situation as the forces on the moon cannot be contacted. Empress Kesa Gothi asks if Adonis, the witch's disciple, is also there. The member responds that it is highly likely. Emperor Goth sees this as a great opportunity to burn the witches once again, along with the moon. He laughs with great satisfaction and boasts. Emperor Goth suddenly desires validation and praise from his empress. He hugs his empress and acts very affectionate. The member is surprised by Emperor Goth's behavior. He had heard rumors that the emperor was unwell, but the person he sees now is like a madman. Suddenly, the empress responds to the member's unease as if she knows what he's thinking. Meanwhile, Emperor Goth continues to express love and asks to be praised by the empress while sticking out his tongue. And at that moment, we are shown that the empress is actually a witch using a love spell. Because Emperor Goth has worked hard, the empress allows him to die. Without hesitation, Emperor Goth slowly advances towards the edge of the palace balcony. The member is, of course, confused about what Emperor Goth is doing. The Emperor declares that he will grant all the Empress's requests. As long as she is happy, his own life is not important. Then, Emperor Goth climbs the balcony railing and jumps to his death. The Emperor dies pierced by the sharp roof of the building. After Emperor Goth dies, the Empress finally releases the influence of her love spell. The member immediately realizes what is happening. The Empress is a witch who enchanted Emperor Goth. He immediately calls for reinforcements at headquarters to fight the witches. Unfortunately, the member is also immediately enchanted by the love spell. He ends up giving a false report that the Emperor slipped and died on his own. With just one spell, the member falls in love and is willing to follow whatever the Empress says. After that, the Empress summons one of her subordinates. Yes, surprisingly, that person is Shirusaji, the head of the Intelligence Bureau. Shirusaji didn't expect the Emperor to be killed today, but he also agrees that the puppet is no longer needed. At that moment, the Empress explains her magic. The love spell can only control men and is not effective against women. That's why witches are a threat to her. She eliminates all threats first by controlling the country from within. However, the Empress's goal is not to conquer the world. At that moment, the Empress removes her face cover and reveals her true form. She is Dorothea, a witch who travels across dimensions, and it seems that Dorothea's aim is to get that man back. Dorothea keeps many photos of that man, and for some reason, his face resembles Adonis a bit. Even Dorothea keeps a feather pen that looks a bit like Adonis. Meanwhile on the moon, Adonis is still trying to force Doroka to help him exterminate humanity. Doroka continues to reject him. Eventually, Adonis decides to eliminate the remaining human warriors while they are still under the influence of the love spell. Due to Doroka's magic, they also die without being able to do anything. However, Doroka truly doesn't want to use her magic. She doesn't want her magic to be used for violence, but now she is forced to use her magic on Adonis. However, Doroka decides not to do it due to Adonis' provocation. Finally, Doroka tries to stop Adonis with sweet words. She says she won't change anything even if he continues to kill. His revenge will only breed new hatred. However, Adonis is fed up with cliché reasons like that. Doroka states that she can't bear to see both sides continue to fight like this. She doesn't want to witness so many lives lost before her eyes again. 
Adonis still doesn't listen and continues to kill the remaining human warriors. What he desires is the death of all humanity as an apology. After that, Adonis returns to Yamato's corpse and takes his smartphone. He also tears Yamato's face and uses magic to mimic Yamato's voice. Then, at the headquarters, they are still in panic because they can't get any news from the forces on the moon. Honestly, they don't believe that everything sent has been destroyed. After all, the elite security bureau forces were sent, including Bureau Chief Yamato. Suddenly, there is a power outage at the headquarters. At that moment, the headquarters receives a signal from the personal terminal of one of the warriors on the moon. Using the remaining energy, they display the source of that signal on the screen. They are very relieved because the one contacting them is Bureau Chief Yamato. He reports that his troops have achieved victory. He requests an immediate report to the Emperor that all the witches on the moon have been annihilated. Unfortunately, the battle was too brutal and humanity also lost many warriors. Yamato informs them that all the warriors have died except for him. Therefore, Yamato requests to be returned to Earth alone, without sending reinforcements again. At that moment, Head of Science Bureau Theta realizes that the one speaking is not Yamato. After the call, Adonis immediately discards the face of Yamato that he had just used. Lady Ophelia, who was on the brink of death, did not expect that this was Adonis' plan from the beginning. He would disguise himself as one of the warriors he baited and escaped from the Witch Kingdom. Adonis still forces Daroka to accompany him. He wants to use Daroka's magic to assist him. Suddenly, Daroka slapped Adonis' face. She didn't expect Adonis to be this cruel. Who knows what Chloe would think if she saw Adonis in his current state. Shortly afterward, there is a teleportation particle surrounding the two of them. In that moment, Lady Ophelia bids farewell to Adonis, the evilest human child. She hopes that the gods will punish him. Lady Ophelia also apologizes for failing to fulfill the expectations of the remaining witches. She can no longer restore the glory of the witches. And now, Lady Ophelia is about to leave this world, especially this ruined kingdom. During the teleportation process, Adonis in his true self seems to feel a bit guilty towards the witches for this situation. Meanwhile, the headquarters is arranging for the teleportation from the moon to Earth to be successful. However, thanks to the suspicion from Head of Science Bureau Theta, they are on alert to shoot at the figure emerging from the teleportation. Theta promises to avenge Yamato. Once the teleportation transmission is complete, the warriors without hesitation shoot towards the teleportation device. Continuing to Episode 7, the Earth Headquarters has prepared teleportation for Yamato Bureau Chief. However, from the earlier communication, Theta Bureau Chief realizes that the one speaking earlier was Adonis in disguise. She has also deployed troops surrounding the teleportation circle to shoot Adonis once he appears. In the final moments before teleportation completes, Theta Bureau Chief instructs the troops without hesitation to open fire. However, to everyone's surprise, no one emerges from the teleportation circle. The crew then realizes that there was an additional command in the teleportation system. The teleportation coordinates seem to have changed. As it turns out, when Adonis was in the process of teleporting to the moon, he used his magic again to mimic Yamato's voice. With that voice, he could alter the teleportation system commands through Yamato's smartphone. Afterward, Adonis and Daroka teleport to a desert far from any settlement. The night view there is filled with stars. Adonis points out to Daroka that they are observing the Southern Cross constellation, indicating that they have successfully returned to Earth. Adonis declares that he cannot rush if he wants to bring down Rivia. He needs a well-thought-out plan. While heading towards Rivia in the Northern Hemisphere, Adonis intends to attack any villages and towns that encounter. However, suddenly Daroka sits down, expressing sadness. She says she wants to go back and live with the witches. Firmly, Adonis states that none of the witches will survive in that situation. Daroka remains indifferent and insists on being returned. Adonis, unable to withstand Daroka's sulking, retaliates, mentioning Adonis always talking about revenge. At that moment, Adonis used a written summoning spell to recall memories when Daroka asked Yamato not to hunt witches anymore. He also urged humans to make peace with witches. Adonis found Daroka to be a very strange and crazy witch for wanting to reconcile with humans. Daroka did not expect Adonis to say that. In the past, 
Daroka always looked forward to meeting Adonis. She was always curious about the person Chloe chose as her disciple. Daroka admired the fact that she could be a witch's disciple despite being a human. Daroka thought Adonis would be a bridge between humans and witches because he lived in both worlds. After hearing Daroka's words, Adonis felt even more that Daroka did not understand him. Daroka insisted that Adonis should understand after the battle on the moon. Just like Adonis who hated humans, humans also hated Adonis very much. Daroka wanted to break the chain of hatred. Nevertheless, Adonis remained firm in his decision. For him, Chloe's life was more valuable than the lives of all humanity. He wanted to destroy a world that took her life. Adonis even considered the deceased witches on the moon as a shield for his return. Doroka was not accepting of Adonis' words. Those witches had fought fiercely to survive witch hunts. She would not allow Adonis to mock their sacrifices. Adonis responded by accusing Doroka of tarnishing her sacrifices. All Doroka did was talk as if she were wise. Yet when her people were killed, she remained silent and just watched. Now, she wanted to make peace with the humans who killed them. Doroka continued to try to convince Adonis that the wounds in her heart would not heal even if she successfully avenged them. Adonis was aware of that but didn't care. He had nothing left now. As Adonis began to walk away, Doroka chased after him, causing both of them to fall. Doroka reminded him that Chloe sacrificed her life to save Adonis. Therefore, no matter how brutal, empty, and cruel the world may be, Adonis shouldn't fall into the abyss of emptiness. Doroka wasn't asking Adonis to forgive humans, but he needed to stop seeking revenge. If not, gradually, his heart would crumble. It would become like the people who killed Chloe. Although Adonis was slightly moved, he still felt that Doroka didn't understand him at all. For Adonis, revenge was the meaning of his existence. Irreplaceable proof that he once lived with Chloe. If Adonis stopped seeking revenge for Chloe, his existence would also vanish. Adonis was afraid that it would happen. In that moment, it seemed that Adonis's injuries from the fight on the moon were getting worse. His bleeding continued, rendering Adonis unconscious. At the same time, a group of motorcyclists spotted Adonis and Doroka from a distance. From afar, the two of them did appear to be in an intimate moment. The motorcyclists assumed Adonis and Doroka were a young couple on the run. Their leader, named Punch, decided to approach the two of them. The next morning, Adonis woke up in a room. He was tired of always waking up in unfamiliar places. Adonis tried to remember what happened last night. He recalled losing consciousness and a group of motorcyclists approaching. Then, Doroka sought their help. So, Adonis assumed that this place was the territory of the motorcycle gang from the previous night. Shortly after, coincidentally, the leader of the gang, Punch, entered the room where Adonis slept. Punch casually sat in a chair and offered Adonis some alcohol. From Punch's appearance, Adonis realized that he was an outcast. Punch then introduced himself to Adonis. Adonis asked Punch about the girl who was with him. Punch replied that the girl had just taken care of Adonis and was taken away by his subordinates. Punch then invited Adonis outside to meet Daroka. As they left the room, Adonis finally learned that this place was a small settlement in the middle of the desert. The inhabitants were from developing countries, refugees, slaves who escaped from Redia, and those abandoned by science, all castaways. Gradually, they all became outcasts. Adonis also realized that the alcohol punch offered was produced in Redia. Not far from there, Adonis heard the sound of a girl screaming. The source of the sound was surrounded by many men. Adonis, with a negative assumption, immediately went down to approach the sound. However, upon closer inspection, it turned out to be Doroka's loud voice struggling to ride a motorcycle. Doroka couldn't stop the motorcycle, and the men there found entertainment in Doroka's antics. At that moment, Doroka realized that Adonis was also there. She was relieved that Adonis finally woke up. Due to Doroka's lack of focus, she fell off the motorcycle. Suddenly, Doroka handed a pair of dolls resembling herself and Adonis. She said the dolls were proof of making amends with Adonis. She apologized for speaking out of turn. On that evening, the people in the settlement threw a party. Doroka happily served as a waitress, delivering food and drinks to them. Meanwhile, Adonis merely observed the party from a distance. People who saw Adonis behaving like that became curious if Doroka was having a fight with her boyfriend. However, Doroka denied that their relationship was like that. 
One man asked why, if they were not dating, they were alone together in the desert. Another man speculated that maybe their country was also destroyed by Redia, just like everyone else, and they ran here because of that. Doroka tried to provide a convincing answer. Later, Doroka replied that she and Adonis were travel companions. They were traveling the world together. When answering, Doroka did not mention the name Adonis to prevent people here from recognizing the witch's disciple. The men who heard Doroka's answer laughed, not expecting that someone would be traveling the world in the current state of the world. In the midst of the party, suddenly, everyone who drank alcohol collapsed on their own. Adonis then approached Doroka. It turned out Adonis was the culprit. He didn't poison their drinks but rearranged the alcohol structure to turn it into a sleeping potion. Adonis was surprised that Doroka didn't know that spell, considering she was a genuine witch. Doroka admitted that she wasn't very proficient in spellcasting. After that, Adonis took a pistol from one of the sleeping men. Doroka panicked and pleaded with Adonis not to kill them. However, Adonis had no intention of killing them. He said that outcasts weren't even considered human, they didn't deserve to be killed. Adonis also stated that he didn't seem to need Doroka. He and Doroka both lost someone precious, but Adonis couldn't enjoy it like Doroka, especially considering blending in with these outcasts. They were different, so Adonis decided to leave Doroka here. Doroka responded that she was forced to blend in with the community. To avoid suspicion about her identity, she could only laugh and serve them. Adonis added to his words. Precisely because they were different, Adonis hoped that Doroka wouldn't become like him. From that night until dawn, Doroka remained sitting in sadness. Punch had awakened and realized that the man with Doroka had left. He didn't expect a beautiful girl like Doroka to be left alone in a place like this. Despite this, from Adonis's words last night, Doroka knew that Adonis was a good person. On the other hand, Adonis had walked quite far from the outcast settlement. He felt annoyed for remembering all the moments with Doroka. Then, Adonis realized that a motorcycle was approaching him. He began to question whether the sleeping potion he gave was too weak. Nevertheless, Adonis was prepared to fight anyone who stood in his way. Returning to the conversation between Doroka and Punch, Unexpectedly, Punch revealed that he already knew that the man with Doroka was the witch's disciple. It turned out that Punch had met Klo and Adonis before. When he was near death in the desert, Punch was saved by both of them. Punch roughly understood what had happened between Doroka and Adonis. Although Doroka's thoughts were correct, Punch felt that the matter of revenge was complicated. He understood that Adonis chose the path of revenge even though he knew there was no turning back. Punch then asked Doroka what path she wanted to take. She replied that she didn't want to see people die anymore. Previously, she couldn't protect her friends, so at least now she wanted to protect Adonis. From their conversation, it turned out that the motorcyclist chasing Adonis was Doroka. She decided to join Adonis. Continuing to episode 8, the citizens of the Redia Kingdom appear peaceful, unaware of what is happening behind the scenes. Soon, there will be a coronation ceremony for the new emperor. Oz is seen on duty, monitoring the streets to ensure security. Before the coronation, the MC pays tribute to the previous emperor. As the 23rd emperor, Emperor Goth brought a super-industrial revolution to the kingdom. Human civilization flourished thanks to Emperor Goth, eliminating the need for reliance on magic. The human race regained its honor through science and military power. However, Emperor Goth is not immune to the threat of illness, leading to his current demise. Nevertheless, the MC is confident that the people will always remember Emperor Goth, who bestowed numerous blessings upon the world. Afterward, the MC announces that Redia will have a new ruler. The citizens present are already very excited. Although this is a coronation ceremony, the appearance of Queen Dorothea as the new ruler resembles an idol concert. She is also wearing an idol costume and dancing accompanied by some girls. It seems that Dorothea intentionally does this to spread her love magic to all the men watching her. Everyone, whether in person or online, becomes infatuated with her performance. The topic immediately goes viral on social media. Meanwhile, in a country with a structure similar to Asia, some people there are also watching the coronation ceremony of the Redia Kingdom. However, for some reason, it seems they are not affected by the love magic. In fact, a man with a scar on his eye learns that the new ruler is a witch. 
He also knows that Dorothea, the witch, eliminated her own kind with scientific power, then elevated herself to queen and took over the world. After finishing her song, Dorothea wears a crown on her head and is officially crowned as queen. At the same time, the head of intelligence, Shirusagi, is also watching Dorothea using her phone. She is in the southern hemisphere desert looking for Adonis. However, for now, she is at a dead end. Adonis is clever for destroying the terminal she took from Yamato, making it impossible for Shirusagi to track his current position. She is forced to search for him slowly. Currently, Adonis and Doroka are continuing their journey on a motorcycle. Even though Doroka insisted on joining, Adonis has no intention of giving up on revenge. Doroka states that she has an idea. According to her, there must be many good people in this world, just like Punch. So she asks Adonis to make an exception and not kill such people. Adonis immediately rejects her. Clearly, Adonis allows Doroka to come along as long as she doesn't interfere. Then, Adonis wants to confirm Doroka's magic. Her love magic can make men melt and control them. If that's true, Adonis wonders why Doroka didn't use that magic on him in Rivia. He is convinced that Lady Ophelia would have instructed Doroka to bring him back, even if it meant using that magic. Besides, that would have been the quickest way. In Rivia, Doroka, on the contrary, tried to persuade Adonis. He wants to know why Doroka did that. Doroka simply answers that she didn't want to do it their first meeting. Well, at least Adonis agrees with that. Shortly after that, Adonis and Doroka arrive in a small town with a sign reading Sand Land. The condition of the sign and the buildings in the background seems to have been abandoned for a while. Adonis instructs Doroka to wait near the motorcycle while he checks around. However, Doroka seems panicked and wants to come along. Despite being a bit troublesome, Adonis allows it. By the way, Adonis becomes curious about the large shoulder bag Doroka has been carrying. It turns out that the bag contains many items given by Punch. There are canned food, nutritious biscuits, bandages, blankets, and various drinks. In addition to these items, Doroka also shows a portable tent. When the button is pressed, it turns into a relatively large snowman-shaped tent. Adonis seems uninterested in all of Doroka's explanations and walks away first. From the outside, it seems like there's nobody in this town. Doroka views it as a ghost town, even getting paranoid about the possibility of ghosts appearing. Adonis observes that there are no signs of fights in this town. He wonders why it has become uninhabited. Afterward, they decide to enter the largest building in town, the police station. Perhaps they can gather some information there. Adonis warns Doroka to be careful as the building is old. Just as he mentioned that, Doroka suddenly screams because a mouse passes by. When things settle down, the Roka is startled again because a bat flies by. Not only that, she also gets caught in a spider web, and her foot gets stuck in the decaying wooden floor. Adonis becomes quite frustrated, especially since he had advised her to be cautious. As they continue to climb the stairs in the building, a hologram of a police figure suddenly appears. The hologram is still functioning well and provides information about various services in the office. Doroka screams again, thinking there's a ghost. It seems she is not familiar with hologram technology. Adonis then explains that the person in the hologram is just a 3D image. However, the hologram no longer serves any purpose as the town's residents, protected by the police station, are no longer present. Adonis and Doroka continue to explore the police station, hoping to find useful information. They even enter the underground prison in the office. Despite both of them having unpleasant experiences with prisons, they still explore it. Suddenly, Adonis stops because he hears a sound not far from there. He tells Doroka to stay silent for a moment. The sound becomes clearer, and it seems to be the sound of someone singing. And indeed, there is a middle-aged man singing with a guitar accompaniment inside a cell. Next to him, it looks like someone is sleeping. When Doroka tries to talk to him, the man doesn't hear and continues singing. Then, Adonis gives Doroka permission to shout at him. Finally, the man is startled by Doroka's loud voice. Of course, he is confused by the arrival of Adonis and Doroka. Supposedly, there should be no one left in this town. Doroka explains that they are just wanderers passing through this town by chance. For some reason, Adonis's face looks serious as he observes the objects around the man. Then, the man asked why wanderers like them entered this place, as seen there's no one in this town. 
However, it's Adonis who finds it strange that there's a man inside the prison. With innocence, the man replies that he is a prisoner, so it's normal to be in jail. Even so, Adonis realizes something peculiar about the prison cell the man entered. He also doesn't believe that the man is a prisoner. Soon enough, Adonis understands what's happening to the man and decides to leave. He says there's no point in staying in this town. Hearing Adonis' words, the man recalls that the people in this town also felt the same way before. That's why they all left. More precisely, everything changed because of the super-industrial revolution. Humans managed to eliminate the witches. However, this town still lives in poverty. It's understandable that its residents became disgusted. The future of humanity, hope, and pride brought one grand dream after another, causing a massive migration. The man feels that the current world situation is similar to when the witch hunt began. According to him, in this era, everyone is just imitating what the first person did. Adonis becomes curious if there's a nearby large city. The man answers that there's the Minuta city about 70 kilometers to the east from here. After learning this, Adonis urges Daroka to leave promptly. Before leaving, Daroka apologizes for disturbing the man while he was singing. Once outside the police station, Daroka feels pity for the man. If left alone, he will die of hunger. Since this town is uninhabited, Daroka asks to release the man. If Adonis refuses, Daroka insists on giving the man some food from Punch. Adonis can't understand why Daroka didn't realize it. He informs her that the prison cell wasn't locked. Adonis feels that what the couple needs is not food. They only need undisturbed peace. Daroka is a bit confused about why Adonis refers to them as a couple. It turns out that the person sleeping next to the man is his wife, who has already passed away. Her body has fully turned into a skeleton. The man, Sasha, calls her by name. He sings for his beloved wife. Indeed, the man doesn't want their time to be disturbed by others. It seems the man harbors deep regrets. In the past, the people in this town insisted that Sasha was a witch. Therefore, they imprisoned his wife. Since the people in this town are no longer around, the man promises to always be with his wife. He deeply regrets not being able to protect Sasha back then. Daroka didn't expect such an incident. Setting that aside, Adonis now plans to go to Minuta City after hearing the information from the man.